we've still got a lot to do here. I want to share this with you, and I hope you take it the right way. Don't relax and think, ah, oh, we're here, and it's over. I, I watched some friends of mine planted a church down in southern Illinois. They got in their sanctuary, and the people sat, and I'm not exaggerating. My wife can attest to this. 19 years later, we went in there, and the building was never completed. Wow. The trim was never put up. Painting was never done in certain rooms, and you know, I don't want that to happen. We've got a lot to go to get done in short time to get it done in. We've got one nursery almost done, and that one's a temporary nursery while we build the two uh, bigger ones, so we're going to need help. I am going to say this. This week, I'm going to slow down. Your pastor is exhausted. I have put in anywhere from 11 to 14-hour days every day for the last three weeks. I can't do it anymore, so I'm going to take a couple days and rest. But after that, we're going to hit it running again. Uh, but it's good to be in our new home and know that they're not going to sell this one out from under us. Uh, we've got room to grow. If you don't know, I know many of you don't know, you look at it, somebody walked in and said, this isn't much bigger than what we had in the other place. It's a whole lot bigger. Yeah. Uh, I measured it out just to show one day. It, if you look at the back of that second row of chairs, that's where the other building ended. We got that much more. But if you turn around and look at that back wall there, you people online can't see this, that's coming out. The next wall is coming out all the way to the end of the hallway. And at one point, we're going to be able to put 200 in here. And I, I believe in God for that. To have and a few of us have been talking. We've already got plans beyond that stage. So, But that can wait for another day. I'm exhausted. Anybody else? I, I'm at this place that I, I chose this song for this reason. Sometimes we just need to say, God, would you breathe on me? And I'm in that place today. And I want us to sing this song. Clint Howard wrote this. He pastors down in Orlando, Florida. I love his music. And I love this one especially. Sometimes we just need to say, Lord, I need your breath. Because his breath brings life. Amen. 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 So I want to go to the Lord in prayer first. And then I want us to sing this song. And if you're like me and you need a refreshing, a refreshing in your body, let's just make this song our prayer today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this first time that we can gather together in this place. We thank you for those that are able to be here. And there have been several that have messaged they couldn't make it today. I pray that you'd be with them where they are, doing what they have to do. And Lord, for those that are tuning in online, we pray, Lord, that you would minister to them. We know that there are several that are shut in and can't get out to church anywhere. And I am thankful that we have this tool that we can reach them and let them be in the presence of God as well. Father, I know I'm not the only one. We have so much going on in this life. We get so worn out and frazzled and our minds are taxed. And sometimes we come into the house of God and rather than giving you praise, we need something. And today I'm in that place and I ask for God that you would touch me, give me a fresh touch of energy, of refreshing in my spirit, Lord God. And I pray for each and every one, Lord, that when we leave this place today, we would say and mean it, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to give you thanks and praise for what you're going to do, not only today, but Lord, I believe you have orchestrated this entire move and I thank you for the future. I thank you what is going to unfold here. And I thank you for every soul that we're going to see saved through this ministry. And we give you all the glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now we're going to sing that simple song, Just Breathe on Me. <clears throat> breathe on me. Breathe on me. Holy Ghost power. Breathe on me, yesterday's gone, today I'm in need, Holy Ghost power, breathe on me, sing that again, breathe on me, breathe on me, Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Yesterday's gone, today I'm in need. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Rain on me, rain on me. Holy Ghost shower, rain on me. Yesterday's gone. Day I'm in need, Holy 
your shower rain on me burn in me burn in me holy ghost fire burn in me yesterday's gone today i'm in need holy ghost fire burn in me breathe on me breathe on me breathe on me holy ghost power breathe on me yesterday's gone today i'm in need holy ghost power breathe one more time breathe on me breathe on me holy ghost power breathe on me yesterday's gone yesterday's gone yesterday's gone today i'm in need holy ghost power holy ghost shower holy ghost fire burn in me lord that's our prayer today would you just Amen. anoint us afresh and new lord so many times we look for the pastor to be anointed but lord i believe that your desire is for every one of your people to walk in the anointing of god and i pray that that anointing would fall on them right now lord god that we would be instruments of worship and lord when we leave this house that we would go out telling others about a God who loves them, a God who came and died for them, Lord. And Lord, because of them, we have life and life eternally. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing right now. I thank you for the touch that I feel even now, Lord. Lord, we just give you glory today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long.
amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. having trouble hearing or is it just me? <laughs> it's just me here. Uh, you can be seated just for a moment. I said we're going to stop this, but I'm going to ask. I know I've seen Bob already take an offering around. Let me share. We got some new folks with us today. and I, Somebody online asked me, what am I talking about with the boxes? If you look over here to this side, there's an offering box and there's one on the back wall back there. I found out the hard way I couldn't put one over here because that wall's concrete. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Why am I doing that? I, I've shared this before, and I hope you won't, don't get tired of hearing it, but people need to understand this. When I do the drive through prayers, now it's happened four times in the last few months. Young people especially have pulled up or walked up in some cases and asked me how much did it cost to be prayed for. And it's made me to realize that so many times the image that we have given is you come to church, you're expected to give. Now, we know as Christians, the Lord talks about our giving, and it's a privilege to be able to give, and he blesses us for that. But I don't want anybody to feel like if they don't have something to give, they're going to be uncomfortable. So we're phasing out the ushers doing this. And it's kind of interesting. Somebody from another church was in yesterday looking at the building and they said, I like that. And they said, what well, I've told you many times. They said, that's scripture. In the Bible, there were no ushers. There was an offering box. And you brought your offering. It was up to you, between you and God, and nobody else ever checked on you. Yeah. So we're going to be phasing that out. We're going to be going to the offering boxes. But in the meantime, I said we will do this till the end of the year. So, Bob, if you would, I don't know if there's anybody that's been missed, but if you would like to take an offering. And let me just share again for those online. You guys have been such a blessing. I mean, listen, folks, you in here, you're a blessing all the time. But there have been people online that have just kind of picked up the slack. You know, it's been very costly to make this move. And different ones have sent in. My wife just told me that my sister, who sometimes watches online, sent an offering with her yesterday. And there's other people that from California, from Florida, from Arizona, all over the place that have sowed seed into this ministry. Praise and I, I thank God for that because what it says to me is they see something that God is up to. Amen. Yes. The Bible tells us don't sow your seed into bad ground. That's what it says. Amen. Sow your seed into good ground. And I believe people are doing this. I want to say that to you people online. We appreciate that so much. We thank you for your giving. I thank you folks. I don't ever want to neglect thanking you. You guys have been so awesome. People don't think about it this way. We've had soup made for us. We've had chili made for us. We had chicken and noodles made for us. That's sowing seed, too. Yes, amen. Well, we've been working. And I'm just going to say it the way it is. I got tired of eating out. I mean, I, there's not a whole lot of choices in this town anyway. Amen. And uh, I, I, if I have to look at another hamburger anytime soon, I think I'm going to puke right there on the spot. <laughs> I told you I'm a strange one. <laughs> But I, again, I just want to thank you all so much. And I want to say something that a lot of people don't get. I, 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 tire, I tire of seeing ministers and evangelists get up and milking the congregation Amen. for an offering. They guilt trip people. Wow. God told me there's 100 people in this room that you're going to give $100 each and they won't stop. I've seen offerings go on for 25, 30 minutes long until they get that. I figure you know the Lord. He knows you. You can talk to each other. And the Bible says, let the man give as he has purposed in his heart. Right. Yeah. That's what it says. Amen. Amen. You pray about it and do what God tells you to do. Amen. 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 We're going to move on. Let's sing Amazing Love. I'm forgiven. 
forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Sing that part again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. Lord God, when we don't deserve it, you still love us. Yeah. Father, for the forgiveness that you give to us, Lord, we just want to pour ourselves out as an offering to you today. Lord, receive our praises, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord, to be lifted up, to be magnified. Lord, even on our worst days, you are still worthy. And I give you the glory and the honor right now. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. for the anointing. Lord, the anointing breaks the chains of bondage. Amen. And I thank you for that anointing today. And I pray, Lord God, now that you would give me the strength, the clarity of mind to speak the word as you've laid it on my heart. I pray that you would anoint every ear and every heart to receive the word today, Lord God. Let your word do its intended purpose and we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. I'll, I'll tell you this first and scare you then. 
I have 22 pages of notes. <laughs> I, I was talking with Sister Robin yesterday, and I told her, I said, it's been amazing because I was struggling for what to share today. And the Lord began to speak to me late the other night. I think it was late Wednesday night. And all of a sudden, it just began to flow. And I, after I got to about page 10, I thought, oh, this is definitely at least a two-parter. <laughs> So I'm not going to dump all 22. Matter of fact, so I wouldn't have the temptation, I only brought 12 with me today. <laughs> That's all right. I, I want to share today, pardon me, I want to share with you a story I heard once that kind of sets the stage. I want to talk today and next week about it's time to say something. It's time for the body of Christ to learn to speak out, to say something. Yeah. There was a story that about a businessman, very wealthy businessman who moved to Portugal. He'd been there for a while and Christmas season started approaching and he realized he was not going to be able to go home to be with his family. And so he began looking for the perfect gift to send to them and that would make up for their only son not being home for Christmas. And he got to talking with a friend there in Portugal and he said, I've got the perfect gift. He said, I know this guy who has a pet store and he has the most beautiful macaw there. If you know what a macaw is, it is a beautiful bird that is grows in the tropic regions. Just as a side note, a few years ago, my wife and I and our family were somewhere in Mexico. I don't remember exactly where we were at. And we went to a place where you could do all kinds of hiking and swimming and things. And we're out in this lake, and all of a sudden, a flock of birds went above. But it wasn't like we see here. It was a flock of macaws. You've never seen anything so amazing. All the different colors filling the sky. Anyway, this guy looks at this macaw and he said, man, that is a beautiful bird. And he said, how much? And the owner said, $3,500. <laughs> he said, whoo, $3,500 for a bird. He said, yeah. And he said, but let me tell you this. If you intend on sending it back to the United States, the bird has to go through inspection, has to be given certain shots, and it's going to be another $1,500. The guy says, $5,000 for a bird. And he gets to thinking about it. He says, yeah, mom and dad's going to be so disappointed I'm out there, I'm going to buy the bird. So he buys the bird. He goes through the inspections and all the shots, and they ship the bird back home. And on Christmas morning, he calls home, talks to his dad on the phone. He said, Dad, did you get the bird? And he said, sure did. It was delicious. <laughs> he said, Dad, tell me you're kidding. He said, well, no, the bird was delicious. He said, you ate the bird. And he said, yes, I ate the bird. He said, but that bird could speak perfect Portuguese and English. I paid $5,000 for the bird. The bird would be a companion and talk to you. He said, well, the bird should have said something. <laughs> Well, church, it's time for us to say something. In the book of Job, chapter 22, you can turn there if you want, but I'm going to rush on because I've got a lot to cover today. Job 22, I want to look at one verse, number 28. It says, you shall declare a thing, and it shall be established for you, so light shall shine on your ways. Now look, let's read that again. You shall also declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. I don't do this very often, but I want you to do something with me. I want you to repeat after me. I decree, I decree God establishes, God establishes light, comes. light comes. Say it again. I decree, I decree God, establishes, God establishes, light comes. Light now, when the word says that you shall decree a thing and it shall be established for you and light shall shine on your ways, it seems to imply to me, and I hope you'll agree with me, that it means that I play the first role in this. Uh -huh. A lot of people sit around saying, I'm just waiting on God. We'll do something. <laughs> say something it says you declare God establishes light comes it, it seems awful clear to me that we have a time to speak out what did Jesus say and you shall speak to the mountain he didn't say wait till God tells you to speak to the mountain come on, right. come on right. hear me right. speak to the mountain and it shall be removed yeah. now let me ask you a question. Are there times that we need to speak out? Why should we as 
believers in Christ, the one and only true God, who has said all power and all authority in heaven has been given unto me, and he tells us he's given us the keys to the kingdom. Uh -huh. Why do we sit around and let things happen to us? Silence. <laughs> Why get carried away by the enemy when you should say something? Come on. Why get battered by illness when we should say something? Right. Amen. Why live with the kind of things that we have to put up with when you could say something? And I'm not talking about complaining. That's right. See, like most people, I'm going to be honest, I have had moments in my life when I should have said or done something and I stood there and kept my mouth shut. Yeah. Come on, we've all done it. Yeah. Amen. But I want to talk about this in a spiritual sense today. We read in the book of Obadiah where there is a passage where Obadiah is indicting the people of Edom because when Nebuchadnezzar's army came and carried away the children of Israel, took all of Israel out of Jerusalem and took them captive, here's what he said to them. In the day of their captivity, you stood by and said nothing. And you became just like the enemy. Yeah. Now let that sink in. When we don't speak out, when we don't do what God has given us the unction inside of us to do, we're just like the enemy. Yeah. Come on. That's, right. That's his word. So to say nothing, to do nothing, it is just like the ones persecuting. Right. I'm sure we've all heard the stories. I don't don't have time to go into it. How many people heard about what was going on when Hitler was taking all the Jews and rounding them into camps? And people said, well, not my circus, not my monkeys. <coughs> not my concern. And we know what happened. We know how it took thousands and killed them. We can use story after story like that. To say nothing is to become just like the enemy. Right. But I want to focus on this for today and for next week. Declare something. What does that mean? I, I can't speak for anybody else. But when I walk into this building or whatever church I may be in, I walk in expecting something from God. Amen. Yesterday I was here and Robin came by and was helping to clean and thank you again Robin for that and she said I'm so ready for church somebody messaged me on Facebook I can't think who it was and they said I can't wait to worship there that's the way it ought to be yes amen. it shouldn't be all Sunday morning of what I'm going to decide what to get ready what to wear and I'm going to rush in and just see if the preacher can move me today come on come on no you come with a heart of expectancy yeah. Yes. Amen. When we come with that heart of expectancy, we see things. See, I don't know what God is going to do. When I come here and I expect something from God, I have no idea what he's up to. Right. I don't know. Sometimes I do. Most of the time, I'm clueless. I'm just here. Lord, I'm your vessel. Do what you want to do. But I do expect him to do something because he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Amen. And so I expect God to do something. Here's the thing I hope you understand. God knows what you have need of. Yes, amen. And so many times we come with, in our mind, when I say I expect, I'm not demanding. Right. There's a difference. Right. Many times we come in expecting God to do what we want him to do, and we totally miss the boat on what he's trying to do in our lives. Uh -huh. When we come into the house of God, wherever it may be, we need to come with this attitude, Lord, you know me better than I know myself. So whatever it is you want to do today, I am an open vessel yielded before you. Do in me what you want to do. Yes, amen. So I don't know what God is up to, but I know this. He's a good God. Yeah. Yes. He's a great God. He's a gracious amen. God. Amen. And he hears us when we call. And he knows what we have need of before we even ask. Uh -huh. right. See, I find it amazing. I, I don't know if you ever think like I do. I, I know my mind is pretty unusual. But sometimes I think about with all the people in the world, why did he call me to preach? I mean, really, I mean, there's people when as soon as they hear my name, they think, oh, scoundrel and a whole lot worse. <laughs> you know, by my standards, I shouldn't be somebody qualified to share this gospel, but he had a plan. 
Yeah. And guess what? He's got a plan for you. Yeah. And what it, the thing is, we've got to be open to what he wants to do. Not that so many people say, I want God to call me to ministry. Get that out of your head. Right. right. If he calls you to ministry, you will know it. But you don't get to tell him what to do. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Now he says, I, I want to take, share the story. If you want to turn there and follow along, I'm going to kind of just loosely skim it. But it's in the 24th chapter of Genesis. This is a, a fascinating passage to me. I, I've read it again and again because there's so much there that if you don't stop and think about it, you miss the most powerful moments of it. In Genesis chapter 24, Abraham sends his servant out to find a wife for his son. Now, just stop and think right there. How would you feel if daddy said, I'm going to send one of our servants to get you a wife? Well, wait a minute, don't I get a voice in this? Don't I get to say something? Don't I at least get to check her out first? Abraham sends the servant to find a wife for his son, Isaac. And he sends him 500 miles away. And he goes this journey, and he stands by the well. And if you read this passage, this is the servant's dealings with God, okay? I, I love this. He tells God where he's at, as if God doesn't know. He says, God, I'm standing here by this well. And God says, no kidding, I put you there. <laughs> But, you know, think about this from the servant's perspective. He's been given the task of finding the wife for his boss. How would you like to fail on that mission? Right. So he, he goes out there. Let's go ahead and read this part. Start at verse number 11. Genesis 24, start with verse 11. And he made his camels kneel down outside of the city by a well of water at evening time the time when the women go out and draw water. And then he said, O oh Lord God of my master. Notice his words. He didn't say, my God. God of my master. Please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed by your servant, Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now, let me ask you a question. You're going to have to put on your thinking caps in a minute. What did God have to do to answer that prayer? Because it already says the women are already on their way out there. And now he's praying, Lord, let the woman be there. God was moving before the question was ever asked. Right. You can hold on to that. I want you to think with me. They're on their way out there to get the water, but it gets even better. The Bible says in verse 15 that while he was still speaking, the words were still coming out of his mouth, and here comes Rebecca. God is orchestrating all this while he's still journeying the 500 miles. Mm -hmm. you got to see something for your life, folks. God already knows. Yeah. He's, right. he's waiting on you to take some action. What if he had not come? None of this would have happened. He had to move and go to where he's supposed to be. But God is orchestrating this whole thing. I'm telling you, that takes a great and mighty God that we serve. Amen. 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 And he goes to Rebecca. Now, I want you to follow what happens here. He says, may I have a drink? She says, sure. So she goes and gets him a drink. She looks at his camels and says, are these camels yours? And he says, yes. And she says, while you're drinking, may I water your camels? And he says, yeah, sure. Anybody here ever water a camel? <laughs> I haven't. But I got curious and I looked it up. You know me, I, 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 I like facts. I like digging in a little bit. It would have taken her a minimum of three hours 
to water these camels. They, they say that the average camel, I, I'm forgetting the numbers in my mind right now, but it, it's a massive amount of water that they drink. So this woman volunteers to draw picture after picture after picture to water all these camels. So he's just sitting back watching her. After all 10 camels are watered, he walks up to her, thanks her, and gives her a gold bracelet and a ring for her nose, and he asks her, who's your father? She tells him. And in that moment, he begins to celebrate. Read it for yourself. He begins to celebrate, not before. Now stop and think about this. If you have prayed an outlandish prayer, like, oh Lord, let one of these ladies come out here, give me a drink of water, and by the way, let them water my camels for the next three hours. <laughs> Somewhere in that part, I think I might say, hey, this is the one. Right. <laughs> he doesn't see that until she finally tells him the name of her father. Yeah. Anybody ever been in that spot? God's doing stuff and you're standing there oblivious to what he's doing all of a sudden. And it's like, ah, now I get it. I see what you've been up to all along. <laughs> That's what's been happening here. Yeah. Now, as God is orchestrating all this, He's also speaking to Rebecca. I want you to see this. I, I promise, I, I can't get this out of my head. My, my roots are Pentecostal, okay? And I know Pentecostal folks. Pentecostal folks would have been shouting as soon as she said, do you want a drink? Uh -huh. <laughs> would have been all over. That's God! <laughs> but some of us are a little bit slower, and we take a little bit more manipulating. But here's what I want you to see today. He decreed something. He said something. Understand this. I think this is very important for people here. I hear people all the time say, I declare a decree. I say that sometimes. If you read my daily confessions and stuff online, I will say that. You don't have to use the word decree. Right. Just say it. Just come out and say, Lord, here's what I would like to see. Understand this. He decreed something. He did not pray and ask God to send a wife for Isaac. Read that passage again. Not once does he ask that. He said, let the woman who comes and does this be the one. Right. He right. said it. He spoke it out and decreed something that, and God honored it exactly the way he said it. Some of us are not willing to open our mouths and say, I decree peace and safety in my family because what if I screw up? I, I don't want to be presumptuous of God. If you're speaking according to his will, you're not presumptuous. Right. Begin to speak out what God has. I want you to get this. The problem for so many of us when it comes to saying something, decreeing something, is because we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't get how it works. Can I tell you something? I've been saved since 1981. been preaching since 1985. I still don't understand it. I just know if I do what God says, he will. Right, amen. I don't have to understand it. See, God does this. It's not your show. Right, amen. It's God. See, I, I, I'm not... Can I, can let me be a little bit weirder than I've been. Does a magician ever show you how he did his trick? No. no. I'm not trying to compare God to a magician, but God doesn't have to show you either. Right, right. right. Just know he will. Amen. When he, when he says, if you do this, I will do this. It's throughout the word. If you. The how is none of your business. <laughs> right. The problem for so many of us is, God, I want you to do this, and then I want this, so I'll know it's you. Do this. No, you know it's him when you say it. Right. And how is not up to you. Come on. I'm gonna hear, I want somebody to hear this. The how is not up to you. That's right. Well, Come if on. this would happen, I'd know it's God. You think the devil's doing it for you? Come on. <laughs> Come on. Trust God. Take him at his word. God does not show us. He doesn't show everybody. What, what, what did Moses pray? 
I want to see your ways. Right. That's not for everybody to see. I'll, let me move on. I'll, I'll get down here and be bottlenecked. I'm just saying this. You don't need to know how, just that God does. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. He says, we will say it this way. Well, God, how did you do that? Let me, let me just sidestep for a minute. This building we're in, my wife can tell you, some of you heard me talk about this. I can't tell you the number of times I came and looked at this building over the last three and a half years. Right. Every time I would come and I would walk in and I would say, that is the spot. Mm -hmm. I got zero response from the tenant or the uh, real estate agent, nor the owner. None. So I would move on and I would go someplace before we ever ended up over there on Henderson Street. I was here first looking. God kept pulling me back here and I kept saying, that's the spot. And I kept looking in other places and I kept saying, but that one over there. And I'd go back and my wife even asked me one time, well, how many times are you going to go back? I don't know, but God said, that's the spot. Right. And finally, when it was time, I came and in three days time, boom. It all opened. I still don't have a lease. <laughs> I can't repeat her words, but the, the real estate agent stood right there the other day and said, that blankety blank real estate agent you got, it, it would get off her backside and get the job done. Talking about herself. But we're here. I, that's why I said there, I said, I'm here having fun getting me out now. <laughs> but my point is this. I kept saying that's the spot. What was I doing? I was decreeing a thing. Yeah. I never one time said I decree. I just kept saying that's the spot. Yes. Amen. And I would keep looking for God to do it. Let me get going where I need to go. God says, or we will say to God, why do I have to go through all this? And I believe God sometimes would like to say to us, you really don't want to know. <laughs> right. But you've got to go through this to get here. Right. So just do what I'm telling you. Right. So we're standing back and we're questioning God and God's just saying, just start talking. Right. Start moving. Start doing what I've told you to do. It's time to say something. Amen. Stop living with the things you live with. <clears throat> I, I had no intention of talking about this, but last Sunday I was preaching and I was talking about my knee. If you remember, my knee last week was so swollen. I don't know if anybody saw it. I could barely get my jeans over the top of it. And it was hurting. And I said something about how that I've prayed for years and years. I've seen countless people healed, but my knee has not been healed. Take too long to tell you the whole story. But the same damage that I had in 1986, when I had my fifth surgery, it's still there exactly the same. It's not gotten any worse. So God is, for whatever reason, he stymied it. Well, Sister Robin wasn't here last week or at the other building. She wasn't there, but she watched it online. And we were here doing some work the other night. And she said, I was watching you preach the other day. And you said something. And she said, you need a creative miracle. Mm -hmm. There are miracles that are creative. Mm -hmm. Right. It took faith for her to take a step out. I'm not trying to build Robin up. I'm just showing, giving you an example. Right. It took faith for her to come to the pastor and say, we need to pray for a creative miracle. Right? Am I healed yet? Not yet, but I'm declaring it. And I'm Amen. standing on it. I'm believing. Right. I'm not going to have a knee replacement. I believe I'm going to have a brand new knee. Amen. And I'm going to keep walking on that thing as long as God has me on this earth. But here's what I want you to understand. If she didn't say it, it wouldn't happen. Right. Amen. Uh -huh. We've got to learn to open our mouths. Let me get back to our text. What did God have to do to bring this miracle about? He had to know before the guy even began to pray that there was a lady out there somewhere. Uh, you want to bear with me because I'm going to teach you between the lines things of scripture that I think when I give you the whole thing, you'll get it. Evidently, Rebecca was fed up with living with Laban. Laban, if you don't know, was her brother. Now, how do I get that? Well, somewhere she's sitting back in her tent. I, I believe that she somewhere said a prayer or something like this. God, you are going to have to do something or I'm going to kill him. 
Now, why do I say that? I believe she was praying. I don't know how long, but I believe she was praying that, Lord, I've got to get out of here. There's got to be something more than this. Laban's driving me nuts. I, I was thinking about this when I was pinning these words on my notes. And I got to thinking about watching my son and my daughter. My Lord, they loved each other. Sometimes they were amazing. They'd be throwing blows. We'd have to separate them, put them on one end of the couch, one the other. <laughs> Leave the room and come back, and they were sitting in the middle of the couch with their arms wrapped around each other. <laughs> they loved each other, but they hated each other. My son said all of his teenage years, he said, I know what's going to happen. He said, when I get married, I'm going to have a daughter just like my sister. And he does. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline is Ashley number two. <laughs> but my point is, brothers and sisters get like that. And the, I think she'd had enough. And I'll hang with me and I'm going to try to show you two plus two here. I believe she was praying, Lord, somewhere out there, you've got something better for me. Uh -huh. Now, let's see if we can make it add up. Here she is in her tent. We don't know what she thought. It may not have been my words, but I believe something like this is happening. She goes out to water, to draw water for her family and bring it back like she does every single day. She meets some strange guy. Get this, we don't even know his name. It's not recorded anywhere. She never finds out his name. She meets this guy gives him a drink, and offers to water those camels. Let's talk about those camels a little bit more. I knew I wrote it down somewhere. One camel can drink 20 gallons of water. She watered 10 of them. Why in the world would you voluntarily water 10 camels? Spend at least three hours drawing all that out of there. I think she had a motive. Now, let's go on. The following day, the servant has made a request to take Rebecca back and talk to the, the, the dad. And he says to the dad, I want to take your daughter back to marry Isaac. They don't know who Isaac is. They don't know who Abraham is. He said, why don't you, the dad says, why don't you let her stay a few days so she can make up her mind? And if I give you the Garrett translation, she said, no, Dad, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Read it. <laughs> she didn't want to wait. She wanted out of Dodge. I, I think God was orchestrating things over here to make her uncomfortable. He will do that sometimes, make you very uncomfortable. So when it's time, you will move. That's right. uh -huh. So she jumps up and is ready. I'm going with this guy who I don't even know his name. And I'm going to marry some guy that I've never seen a picture of. Here's the question. What kind of person, what is the mental state of a person who just says, I'm going? <laughs> right. I believe she's been praying and waiting for God and she saw God moving. How bad does it have to get before we will move that way? Come on. Come on. I'm going to give you some real life issues. I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail, but after my wife, we lived in Cleveland, Tennessee for going on six years and finished her degree and I finished my degree and I was ready to get out and pastor. I called and they talked to me about a church that had been closed for two years. We're looking for somebody to go in there. I prayed about it. Yeah, that, I'll take that. Little bitty town, 1,100 people in that town. I'm talking about Hooterville. That's where we went. <laughs> My brother-in-law, who was my father, who raised me, came down to move us. God had blessed us where we were. We had a beautiful home, literally out the back door, not even as far as that wall. We had a private lake. We, I, it was set on eight acres of land. My brother-in-law brought the U-Haul in, and he looked at me, and he said, Daryl, have you lost your flipping mind? <laughs> he said, why are you giving this up? Because God asked me to. Amen. And I went to a church that had been closed up for two years. They literally scraped mold off of the pews to clean it up before we had church. The only house we could find to rent almost killed us because they had a cracked heat exchange. And 
My brother-in-law say to me all the time, said, don't you wish you were in Cleveland? But the point is, God was orchestrating in me months ahead of time. Right. To get me to move. And so, to me, when I walked into that, it was literally a concrete block building that you could have fit the entire room in this section in, right in here. Mold on the... First time I preached, not exactly, first time I preached, two wasps started dive bombing me and one landed in my hair and stuck. <laughs> because there was wasps all over the building. But to me, that was the Taj Mahal. Because God was orchestrating things in my life. See, when God is moving, you don't have to stop and pray. Doesn't say she prayed one time. I'll go. He had to say something. She had, Dad was trying to get her to stick back. She said, no, I'm ready to go right now. I hope you're hearing what I'm trying to tell you. Right. The servant says, we don't have time to wait. And she says, it's okay, Dad, I'm ready to go. And when they get ready to move, I believe somewhere along the line, it went something like this. Rebecca's riding one of those camels that she'd watered the day before. And she said, you know what? Yesterday, they, these camels belonged to him. Today they belong to me. Yeah. Are you hearing? Wow. Sometimes it takes a radical move to get what God has because when she married in, it all became hers. The scripture tells us in Proverbs, whoever waters will they themselves be watered. Mm -hmm. I'll let that sink in. You're looking for someone to do something for you. But sometimes God's waiting on you to take the first move, to say the first words. So we're, we're sitting around waiting on a breakthrough and rather than say, I declare this. I, I, I'll watch. I hope you guys don't get offended by this and start retracting, but I watch who responds to some of the things I've been putting on Facebook with the daily prayers and with the daily confessions. And I see people, amen, amen. I love Eric. It's always, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we know what he's saying is, I agree with that. Right. When you come into agreement with the word, you can speak that word into your life. Yeah. Amen. Now, here's the part that nobody's going to like. We all love those blessings. But who wants to water the camels? Come on. Come on. Yeah. You need to look at somebody and say, how can I help you water your camels? How can I help you water, water your camels? camels? Not just in this room. We've got to understand when we put forth effort, God will take that yes. and multiply it. Yeah. I, I told you I don't do this often, but I just feel led to do this. I want you to say something with me. Nothing happens, Nothing happens in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God. until someone says something. <laughs> Nothing happens in the kingdom of God until somebody says something. Guess who somebody is? Come on, it's not the pastor. It's you. See, most of us are sitting around waiting for somebody else to say something. We want to go to a revival so somebody will call us out and say a word over us. You say it. Amen. Amen. You have that power and that authority, and God has given us that, and you don't have to wait. Listen, I'm not knocking any evangelists. So they have to do that because we're so strong-headed. Right. Yeah. But you don't have to get to the evangelist. You can look at the word and say, God, it says in your word that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to you. And the Bible says that you're my heavenly father. That means I'm a joint heir to this. Yeah. Yes, amen. Oh. And I'm not trying to tell you that everybody's going to have a Mercedes and a Rolex. That's not what I'm saying. But the point is this. We are living so far beneath our privilege because we're waiting for somebody else to do and God is telling us to do. Amen. Just jump up and start saying something. See, decreeing something literally means to speak out. It means you first have to decide it in your mind. Amen. Make your mind up. I, I'm going to get myself in hot water with this, but over the years I've pastored some schizophrenic Christians, and I don't mean literal yeah. schizophrenics. They tell me one day, oh, I believe God's calling me to do this, and the next week, no, pastor, I believe God's called me to go do that, and the next week, I think God's called me to do that. That ain't God. Come on. Yeah. That's our selfish desires. That's our lust. 
No. Lust is not just over sexual things. Right. We see somebody, we see the recognition, the glory they got, we want it, and I'm I'm called to that. No, you find your calling. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know what? There are some people I love. I don't have time to go there, but go back and read about Obed Edom in the Old Testament. I love this because when you go through this certain passage, it, it names how many workers were doing this, and there's Obed Edom's name. And how many workers were doing this? And Obed Edom was there. You know what he said? I'd rather be a doorkeeper yeah. in the house of God. Yeah. It doesn't have to be a glorious spot. Just let me do something for the Lord. And most of us are sitting back saying, oh, God, use me, but make me a superstar in the process. <laughs> no, that's not it. What did our God say? You shall decree a thing, and it shall be established for you. Decreeing simply means I say it. When I speak it out, I'm going to say something. Some people are going to struggle with this. You need to pray your words verbally. Speak it out. Yes, you can pray inwardly. Yeah. But there are some things we need to speak out. There's something powerful when we speak. I, oh, I wish I had time for this. The word decree. I, I'm just going to have to come back and talk about this another day. I'm not going to get where I need to go today. Solomon used the same word. You're going to have to get into your Bible and really dig to find this. Remember the story where Solomon, the two women have come and there's a dispute over whose child it is. And he says, take the baby and cut it in half. The word is the exact same word for decree. It's, you've made your mind up. I'm going to do this. You, it, you have to be that strong with your word. It's not, Lord, if it be your will, can I lead somebody to Jesus today? No, Lord, today with your help, I'm going to lead somebody to Christ today. It changes when we change our words. Amen. Uh, let me move. <laughs> the same word, i got to say it again, the same word that is translated to cut the baby in half, it is the same word that is used to speak out, to decree. It's settled. Somebody hear me what I'm trying to tell you. You've got to be settled. You can't be that wishy-washy back and forth. I want to do this. I want to do that. I feel like God's called me this. I had somebody tell me for years that God called them to marry Carmen, the singer. I'm like, does he know that? I'm like, that ain't God. That's lust. I'm like, let's bring things to where they need to be. Let me get to where I'm going. I want to try to wrap this up for today. This thing about making up your mind can only be done if you have a surrendered heart to Christ. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I'm going to make up my mind for what Daryl wants. Because right. see, if I had my way, I'd have the most beautiful house with an in-ground pool, and it would be in Fort Myers, Florida. <laughs> but that's not God's plan. <laughs> you may have your own desires, but my point is simply this. When you decree things, decree things differently. What is, if it's an illness, I decree that this thing has to leave in the name of Jesus. The word says, by his stripes, I am healed. Decree that. You, you, you speak it. What do we say? He establishes it. You're not doing it. When you decree it, when you speak it out, God establishes it, then light comes. That means the answer comes. Let me help you out this morning. There is a verse that we quote all the time. We sing about it. You remember the song, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so? Yeah. That comes straight out of the Bible. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The problem is this, and I'm sorry if you're a King James lover. I'm not trying to minimize it. There are errors in translation in cases. It's not a glaring error, but it's the word so doesn't belong there. It literally should say, let the redeemed of the Lord speak it out. Mm. Sylvia, you've got your Bible there. I want you to look this up for me. Psalm 107, verse 2. Mm -hmm. This translation has it read. And I, I'm not going to make her read it out loud because she'll get very upset with me. I love Sylvia and she loves me and I won't leave it that way, all right? <laughs> In that translation, this is the New Living Translation, here's what it says. 
It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He is faithful. His love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak it out. Tell others that he has redeemed you. It's not just saying, I'm saved, I'm saved. Tell somebody. You know what happens when you start telling people you got saved? They start watching you. Are you hearing me? Yeah. A lot of people say, well, if they find out I'm a Christian, they're going to... They're going to tease me. They're going to make fun of me. They might shun me. They might not invite me out anymore. So? That's right. Speak it out. You have the power to say. Let the redeemed of the Lord say. You have the power to decree. And I know you're still sitting there saying, but, but how does it work? It's none of your business. Anybody ever watch the movie The Matrix? And this is my wife's cup of tea. I'm not into that kind of stuff, but I've sat and watched it because she was watching it. And there's a line in that movie that just jumped out at me, and I wrote it down years ago. They were asking, I don't remember the guy's name now, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, know who it is. They asked him, well, how does this work? And here's the response. Your, compre your comprehension is not a prerequisite to your cooperation. <laughs> Your understanding is not required. Right. I believe God speaks in that phrase. Your comprehension is not a prerequisite for you to do it. Right. But I've never seen somebody heal before. Let me watch you first. No, you don't have to. You lay hands. Yeah. Take God at his word and say, in the name of Jesus. I speak healing. Oh, boy, I, oh, that's going to have to come back for next week. You see, here's what I want to wrap it up with for today. And many of you are going to get this finally when I say this. Do you know the name of Jesus can be a decree? How many of us have been in a situation Sudden tragedy or almost accident or whatever. And the only word that can come to mind is Jesus. What are we saying? Jesus, help me. Jesus, change the situation. Jesus, you got to do something because I can't even speak. Jesus' name is not just his name. It is not just a simple word. His name is power. His name is a prayer. It is a declaration. It is a song. It is every tool that we have need of in life. You need to learn to speak the name of Jesus and not as a curse word. Amen. Why do you think the world is taking it that way and trying to make it a curse word? Because they don't want us to understand the power in that name. There's a little chorus that uh, I heard years ago, and I wish I could find the music because I'd love to learn it. But here's the words to it. It says, at the mention of your name, life flows. Mm -hmm. At the mention of your name, life grows. At the mention of your name, miracles. And things that are dead shall live again. Jesus. 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 Amen. The name of Jesus is so powerful. And I want you to understand is when we use it in that way, we are decreeing Jesus, step into my situation, step into this mess, step into this tragedy that is happening. It is a prayer. And what, what you really want to say is, God, I don't understand what's happening at all right now, but I need you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say when I say you don't have to understand? At the name of Jesus, demons tremble. At the name of Jesus, sickness has to flee. We can go on and on. At the name of Jesus, and your comprehension is not a prerequisite to your doing so. I'm going to close. I want to try to share with you a real quick story. Genesis chapter 18. One of the most powerful places, if you would ever read it and really ponder what is happening. In Genesis chapter 18, Abraham is having a conversation with God because God is getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And he said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that it were? Far be it. I want you to pay attention. This is him speaking to God. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteousness, the righteous, should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? So the Lord agrees with him and says if they're 50, and I won't read it all for time's sake, but it goes all the way down to 10. He says, for 10, I will not destroy it. But what I like about this story is this. On three occasions in the Bible, it is recorded Abraham is called a friend of God. How many know you can talk to a friend that way? He said to God, are you really going to do this? He's decreeing a thing. God, there are some righteous here. And as, as it was, there was just a handful and he got them out. But the point is, we talk to people we have relationship with differently than strangers. Anybody remember the story or the song that we used to sing? Sometimes we'll bring it out. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I'll never forget this. This is kind of a side note. We were pastoring out in East Galesburg, and I got a irate call. To, How dare you to sing that song that way? Nobody's a friend of God. And I said, what about Abraham? And they said, well, it was, I, it was him alone. Isn't it funny? And that's what I said to that person. I said, isn't it funny? Nobody ever complained when we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. We didn't like the music all it was. He is your friend, but he's only your friend if you develop relationship. Yeah. Come on, hear me, church. Going to church is not building relationship. Reading a daily devotional is not building a relationship. It's part of it. You build a relationship by talking. Yeah. Most of you know the story how my wife and I, when we met, met her on a Sunday morning at church. Went out to eat with her and her family. Long story, I won't even go there, but got stuck there. And we talked, and we talked, and we walked the country roads, and we went to visit a friend, and we talked, and we talked, and we talked. Rode back into town with him that night. I planned on going to bed because I was working midnights. I hadn't slept from the night before yet, but I went to church with her that night, and afterwards they came over, we had pizza, and we talked, and we talked, and I went to work that night, never haven't gone to bed. The next morning, I called her again, and I talked, and I talked, and I talked, and I told her then, you're going to marry me. <laughs> That's what she did. She laughed at me. <laughs> Eight weeks later, we were married. I say this all the time to people. We knew more about each other in 24 hours than most people know in months because all walls came down, and we talked. We shared our hearts with one another. I'm not telling anybody to go do that, please. Don't anybody do that because I don't want the responsibility on me. <laughs> but my point is this. I watch marriages disintegrate because husbands come in and go one part of the house, wives go to another part, and they don't talk anymore. Come on. Relationships die without communication. Yeah. Now ask yourself, what is wrong with my relationship with God? How much time do you talk with him? Pray without ceasing. The more you know him, you won't have to ask, is this his will? You know, because you know him and you know his heart. When you know him, you're not afraid to decree something because you know what his will is. That's when you can say, I can decree this. He will establish it and light will come. Talking with a friend decrees things between you. Talking with God, you're establishing something that cannot be broken. I I'm going to stop right here and come back next week, but I want to say this to, to the church here and online. We sit around all the time. I I'm going to say something. If you hear me wrong, you're going to think, man, he's lost his mind. 
Some people have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. They've never seen an answer because they never once moved. Are you hearing me? Amen. <laughs> you got to move. Yeah. You got to take a step. Yeah. Others may not understand. That's okay. When you know God, when you know your God, the Bible says, I, I can't quote it word for word, but it says this, those who know their God shall do great exploits. Do you know your God? If you know him, you're not afraid to take a move. You're not afraid to speak something out. I'm going to come back next week and we'll pick up and explain this decree thing a little more. But I want to ask you if you would just bow your heads just for a moment. I had no idea where I was going with this today. But I just kind of got a feeling midway through this that there's somebody here that when you heard some of this, you're like, that's lacking in my life. I know God, but I don't know him that well. I'm not going to call anybody out. I just want, if you would do this, if that's you, and you say, I want to know him that way, why don't you just slip up your hand just for now. Hold it just for a second so I can see it. Amen. 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 Keep it just a minute. Amen. All right, you put them down. Father, I believe you orchestrated this Wednesday night when you began speaking into my heart. And you knew exactly who would be here. And Father, I'm praying right now, Lord. I know that they know you. I know that they have given their life to you. But Lord, they've stopped right there. They've not gotten into the word. And they've not spent time with you. Lord, help them to understand that it's not just a song. That if we will draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And we will walk in your presence. We won't have to come visit your presence. We will walk in it. Father, I pray for a people all throughout this community, Lord. Those that are watching online, even in other states, I'm praying. I'm believing, Lord God, that the church's finest hour is about to happen. That is, believers in Jesus Christ begin to walk in the power and the authority and they begin to decree some things. Lord, we sit and we complain about the government. We complain about the economy. But Lord, how about helping us to speak some words and decreeing a turnaround? Lord, so many want to curse this nation, but Lord, I bless this nation. I speak healing to this land. I pray, Lord God, that political parties would come down. I pray, Lord God, that it would not be about left and right and liberal and conservative. But Lord, help us to be people that are going after the heart of God. And Lord, as we go after the heart of God, I believe, Lord God, we're going to see a change begin to take place. This nation was founded by a people who were pursuing Christ. Let it happen again. Father, let it happen again in the name of Jesus. But Father, I'm praying right here in this town. Lord, you saw the hands of those four that just raised them. And I'm asking, Lord God, it's not going to do any good for me to sit and talk with them. Draw them near. Help them to find that urgency, Lord, to speak to you like I once pursued my wife. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would open a brand new door to them spiritually. That, Lord, that they would begin to realize it's not about going to church. It's about living a life that glorifies Christ. Father, I thank you. I thank you for those that are watching online. Lord, if they're not in a Bible-believing church, put one there for them. Direct them to that church. And Father, I want to give you thanks and praise because, Lord, I believe you're up to something. I believe through this little body here that we're going to see a change begin to take part right here in this area that is going to sweep this city. Other churches are going to stand up and do the right thing and quit tickling ears. And Father, I give you the praise and all the glory. It's all for your name's sake, Lord. And we thank you. Now, Lord, I pray as we leave this house today, watch over your people. The enemy seeks to destroy, but Lord, I speak protection over their lives. I speak healing into their minds, healing into their bodies, restoration in marriages. Father, I believe, Lord God, that you're going to change what people were ready to throw away. You're going to turn it around for your glory. Let it happen now, and I give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen.
I know you're sitting there thinking, where's he going with this? Hang with me for part two. If you can't be here, tune in. Because I believe God's trying to get us to understand something, that when the church begins to speak, miracles will happen. Amen. Let me say this real quickly. Those who are going to the concert tonight, if you don't, don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. It ain't for you. A couple months ago, a group of us bought tickets to go to a concert together. We need to leave here, the church, by 4.30. So 4.15, if you would be here, and uh, that will get us there. Brother, he asked me last night. It's it's early. That's why we're leaving so early. It starts at 6 o'clock. Hopefully, we're going to be home in a decent hour. I've got a wife that doesn't get her sleep. Can I just say this? I love you. I appreciate you. She's exhausted. She's been working here day and night, going home, sewing curtains and different things like that. Drove to Taylorville, did a baby shower for my daughter and her husband and all the family there. Came back and tried to work some more, and she finally crashed last night. And today, she was up. Some of you saw she was up here putting curtains together before church. Amen. Take some rest, hon. <laughs> I, I love her very much, and I want you to know I'm not putting her down when I say this. She was stressing so much over the music because she didn't have time to practice like she wanted to. And that's why I just said, you know what? We can do it without music. Amen. It doesn't matter. Amen? It's for Amen. his glory. But I love you, and I appreciate you giving it all you got. Amen? And I'm Amen. done. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Oh, we will be back for Bible study Wednesday night, 6 o'clock.